fix the wild eyebrows. Hey, welcome. It's Jeff from Home Renovation DIY. We are here again tonight live at 6 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. My son Matt is with me tonight as well. He's going to help us with answering all the questions a little later. First of all, let's just say this show is all about basements. Let's just be realistic. We have a, a few vid videos on basements in our catalog on our page there, and they've been going crazy the last few weeks. And I'm starting to think, I think there's a lot of people out there who are you know, researching, most likely, um, a basement renovation project that's coming up this winter. It's a popular thing. So even if you're in the northern states like we are, it's popular to renovate in the basement in the winter because you can't go out anyway. So you do your inside work in the winter time and your outside work in the summer. And if you're in the south, well, renovating in the winter time makes a lot of sense because it's not so unbearably hot that you can actually get work done around your home. So it makes sense why renovation is such a big subject matter this time of year. And what we're gonna do tonight is we're gonna talk a lot about, and Matt's gonna help me, he's gonna be throwing up some pictures, okay? So we're gonna talk a lot about basement technology. Now, um, this is one of these things where there is no right and wrong answer to any particular question. I get questions all the time, people say, do I need vapor barrier? Do I need this system? Do I need that system? Should I, should I use this kind of insulation system? And the answer is that there are so many different types of basement foundation construction technologies out there over the last 150 years that every single one of them as a group needs to be addressed specifically based on your geography and the age of your house and the kind of improvements that you've done to it and the type of um, heat and air conditioning systems that you have in place. So it's a little complex, which is why when you ask a question, there's always more than one answer because it all depends who you're talking to, how much information they're working with, what assumptions they're making about your particular situation. So tonight we're gonna do our best to try to answer as many questions as possible after we've presented the information and hopefully that will be of help. So, do, you want to get a do we have the first picture of an older, we're gonna start chronologically with an older basement. That's not the older one. Older one. Yeah. Here we go. Okay, so can we shrink this up a little bit? Now we just pulled this off the internet real quick. And what we're looking at here is a, a, a cinder block foundation wall. And this is represents the footing. So they dig a hole, they pour the footing, they get that level, okay? And then they build a wall on top of that. And then what they do is they backfill the dirt after they run their plumbing systems, and then they pour concrete on top of the dirt. And on the outside of the building, you've got what's called a weeping tile, and it's just a pipe that runs around the house below the edge of that footing, okay? And it collects any groundwater that's rising up, so it doesn't put pressure on your slab, all right? It's usually buried in gravel, and in the old days, they just backfill with dirt, call it good, they'd have a downspout, and all the water that went from the roofing system was diverted right here. What ends up happening is all that water soaks up into the ground and if you have clay especially you're going to find that that water is running lateral because clay kind of settles in layers and it all comes to the wall and wants to penetrate all of these different joints. Whew! So that's basically how the technology works. Flip that over to the other screen now. All right and we'll get to this concept in a minute. This is a more modern look but first of all let's deal with this. If you have a block wall foundation wall, you have um, what I'm going to say is an older technology that has a, a high risk of failure, okay? You really, really, really have to pay attention to the drainage on your property, especially if you have clay. Flat ground around your house is your enemy. You want it sloping. You want to have your eaves troughs come down with the downspouts and even put extensions on them. Get that water 10, 12 feet away from the building if at all possible. Um, make sure that you've got uh, gullies or some sort of system for really diverting the water, especially in, during the freeze-thaw cycles, okay? Because if you have a basement, you have colder climate in most cases, which means in the springtime, you can get a nice sunny day that melts a lot of water, but it has nowhere to go because it's trapped by the ice and the snow. And so then it falls into the foundation. Now, the good news is, is if that's your house, you know exactly what you need to do to renovate. You need to uh, have an airspace on the inside of your wall, okay? Now, I know a lot of guys are like, we can dry lock, we can roll a water seal on the, on the stone. 
reality is, is the pressure that comes from that water, from the outside of that block, whatever you paint on there is not going to last. It'll give up the ghost. And if you're going to renovate and finish the space, you want something that's going to last. So have an air seal because what you're dealing with there is the migration of moisture, not so much a water event, right? You're not getting rain. You're not getting a river through your wall. It's just such a high level of moisture that when it reaches the air in your basement, the humidity, that's the relative humidity is really transfers all that moisture into the house. And so the basement's so wet feeling all the time, it doesn't seem like a livable space. But if you build it, and here we're gonna get busy on the old whiteboard there, Max. If you build it, and this is your wall, okay? And we're gonna go like that. And this is the outside, and that's the dirt outside. All right? <laughs> this is fun. And you have your grass. Right? Now, this is a little clear. You have your footing like in that picture. You have your concrete floor. If it's a block wall, underneath here, it's all dirt as well. In most cases, they didn't even pour gravel. They just backfilled with dirt. So what you have is your, your stone, your, your block, and your concrete. Is, they're both in contact with, with dirt. And that moves a lot of water. And so that moisture passes through that because these surfaces are permeable and you have a high relative humidity percentage inside the room, okay? So what you wanna do is put a barrier in here that pushes all of that relative humidity back to this point. Now this is what I call airspace. What you want is an airspace. So when the water comes through, that airspace has somewhere to mig migrate, migrate to, sorry. It'll follow that airspace up to the block wall at the top, which is exposed to outside air, which has a very low relative humidity, okay? And then it'll leave the building. So the moisture will come in through the building, follow the airspace, and leave through the building. And that's how you manage that situation. And on the ground, you also need to have something that pushes the relative humidity down, okay, right at the ground level. This is the video we did with the DMX um, six and a half foot wide dimpled membrane. We covered it in the five eighths plywood. What that does is that pushes it down. Now you've got a vapor barrier at ground level. Ideally, you want to build all your walls on top of that system so that the airspace underneath, it connects to this airspace. And now all this moisture that's penetrating the building has a way to get out, all right? So what you're doing is you're not, you're not sealing up your house. You're not waterproofing your house. You're just managing a high level of relative humidity. In this situation, you go with air, and then you frame your walls, and you add your insulation, and then you put your vapor barrier, okay? And that'll give you a good air seal, and that will work really well for you. Now, if you have poured concrete foundation, and your house is, let's say, older than 1980, it's a generalization, because there's no real rule. Um, things started to change in construction, but it's, it's zone specific, code was all over the place, so you really have to do a little bit of homework. If it's a poured foundation well, it makes no difference, okay? It's the same effect if you have the dirt right up against it, all right? So it doesn't matter if it's stone block or, or poured foundation. They never really got into adding a vapor barrier underneath the floor until more recent. Maybe late 90s was popular. Maybe early 2000s where you live. They went from using dirt to putting in aggregate, okay? They backfill with gravel, all right? Somewhere in the 80s. So you didn't have direct contact with the dirt and the concrete, and that helped a lot of basements stay a lot drier. But it is, it still transfers moisture, just not as fast. In the late 90s, we started putting vapor barrier on top of the aggregate underneath that concrete. So now you had a vapor barrier underneath your floor. And now, what we do now is we realize that that vapor barrier needs to be continuous all the way up to the side of the house. All right. So now what we're doing is we're putting on this DMX membrane that you see in the picture. So now on the outside of the foundation, you'll see this is like a picture of somebody making the conversion. And this is an approach you can take when you're renovating your house from the exterior. You can get rid of the dirt that's sitting against your poured concrete foundation. You can put in the membrane that goes right down. And the idea here is it goes right down and goes over top of this footing. Matt, when you were doing that, were they going mm. right over top of the weeping tile or are they tucking in behind? 
uh, actually goes under the weeping tile. Under the weeping tile. Yeah, okay. So it drains into it. Right. And mm -hmm. so then the weeping tile is left exposed, sitting in its aggregate as well. Okay. So now all the water that comes from rain and, and every other situation runs down the outside of the house. It has diverted the weeping tile, travels back to the street. So now you don't have to have this moisture issue. You don't, there's no need for air there. Because one of the most common questions is, can I just put the rigid foam on the outside wall? The answer is, if you've got this, then the answer is yes. If you don't, then what you have is no airspace and you're going to create a water situation in your house because it's going to condensate right there on the wall, the insulation plant. And that's all going to travel down your wall and you're actually going to start developing um, uh, high levels of water sitting around the foundation plate on the interior walls. And you run the risk if you don't have the right kind of wood of advanced rot and mold. So there's the basic rule with basements is they were never designed to be a living space. <laughs> so if you want to make it into one, keep the, con keep the construction as minimalistic as possible as far as the, the investment because you're going to have a water problem and you're going to need to replace it. And if you want to avoid that and have a more long, sustainable kind of situation, you've got to get into doing foundation from the outside like this. You can use the same technology on the inside of the house. So where you would open the floor, right? And you could put a, a drain system on the inside underneath the concrete as well. And you could have this black membrane running down the wall on the inside, okay? Open the concrete and it, and it actually goes over top of that drain on the inside. So any of the water that migrates through will be collected by the interior drain system of the house. It'll go to a sump pump and remove it. That's another option. But the point is, basements are not designed to be dry unless they're waterproofed from the outside. So if you buy a new house nowadays, most situations that we're dealing with, they're doing this. It's become a real standard. Okay, standard practice. I don't think there's a home builder out there, Matt, that could probably even sell a house if they didn't have the waterproofing on. No, it's, yeah, you gotta have it. They're competing with everybody now. Mm -hmm. When it comes to finishing, you do need insulation, okay? Your insulation needs to be the same thickness in the bottom as it is upstairs. So if you have a two by six insulation cavity up here, that gives you R20. When you're down here, you need R20. That's basic building code. I think that's goes standard for just about everywhere. So you can't cheat and go really thin and go two by four because there's not enough room between the wall and your stud to get R20. And you'll see this, builders will actually cheat here. They'll actually build the two by four wall far off the wall, okay? And then stuff the R20 insulation in. And that kind of works. It's a bit of a cheat. It's not very efficient. Um, I hate seeing it, but it happens because two by fours are a lot cheaper than two by sixes and it'll hold the bat in place. But the idea here, the main goal is to identify first how old is your house. If you have a moisture problem, then you've got to provide air to help get rid of that moisture. Or dig up around the outside of your house, which can cost fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. Like it's huge. Mm -hmm. And put in a waterproof membrane system, okay? Once you've got your insulation, you're going to want to add your vapor barrier. All right. So now you've got everything controlled. Your, your hot air from inside the house that's trying to travel outside your wall is not going to take vapor with it. So you aren't going to get water inside your wall cavity. Boy, that's a real lesson. Hey, you've got some questions, I'm sure. Yeah, now that the video has been, uh, the subject matter has been said. We've pretty much established the idea. <laughs> If it's old, you need a lot more control of the water and the relative humidity in the air passing. If it's newer, you got a lot more flexibility. Um, and the more investment you're putting in your basement, the more control you want to have in place. So let's deal with some specific questions here and hopefully that'll help lend to the conversation. Cool. What do you recommend the gap between the concrete and the inside uh, interior framing be? Doesn't need to be much because remember, we're not dealing with um, water management. We're dealing with vapor management. So if you have a one inch gap, between your, your concrete wall and your, your stud wall. That's all that it takes. Because as the, as the water comes in, in the form of vapor, it's gonna have anywhere relative humidity 40 to 60%. You're okay, you're in a safe zone there. 
So if, if you have a heating system in your home, the air in your home is going to be relatively dry, right? And when the moisture comes in, you're going to go from a 40% relative humidity and the water be coming in from ground. It'll push it to 42, 44, 45, but then it goes up and it dries out right away because the air outside sucks the moisture out of the, out of the stone. <clears throat> so you're okay there. And as soon as you put up a wall with a vapor barrier, now you're restricting the ability, all right, to have getting that dry air mixed in with it. So this air in here is more likely gonna go up to the 50, 55% range. So giving yourself a full inch so that that relative humidity has no obstacles is key. The other thing is you don't want your insulation bat to fall out of the stud bay and make contact with the stone, okay? That's the danger here. We did a video and I showed how to use the um, Tyvek or Tipar paper to hold the insulation in place because we were trying to maintain that air gap. If the bats fall out because the wood twists, okay, now you're, you're stopping your airflow, but you're also making direct contact, which is gonna cause condensation. Next question. Just really briefly this I'll try. time. Uh, explain <laughs> the exterior and interior water drainage system and how it all leads to the sump pump and how it gets to the system itself. Really quickly? Real quick. Okay, the exterior drain is connected to the city water collection system, all right? So the same as when it rains, you have man, you know, little, little, wow, I was gonna go for the movie from the clown. Yeah. Uh, the point is, is the water gets all caught in there. So any groundwater runs down the side of the foundation and gets collected in these pipes and it's all gravity fed, right? They're all sloped to the street. Inside the house, this is what we call a French drain, oddly enough, and that almost seems like it should be offensive to call it that nowadays, but we still call it that. It's, the, it's, it's an it interior is. drain system. And what it is is the waterproofing membrane system that we'd be applying to that is over top on the inside of the foundation, open up the concrete, it goes over the pipe. So now any water that enter, enters the house, whether it's relative humidity or a crack in the foundation, because this will actually protect your basement from any future water invasion or event ever, okay? It all gets collected here. Again, it runs lateral around the foundation and will come to a place where there's gonna be a big pit with a pump in the bottom, and that'll run it up out a sump and then out 20 feet from the house. And so that is an amazing way to manage your water as well. Yeah, our buddy Damien has a 98 house and his basement floor is uh, always, he's always getting heavy rain, right? Yeah. He's wondering if uh, the sump pump is his only option. Because? Just to keep the water out. See, now we run into another, another question. It's called water table, right? Rain is not an issue if your ground is sloped away from your house. Because then the water comes down and it's all following the easiest path, right? Basically, water's always gonna go wherever it's most convenient. So if you have a slope, the water will follow the slope, it won't even saturate the ground. That, that's not gonna be an issue. And so your situation won't be that bad, but if your ground is flat, or like you see in a lot of houses, it's sloped towards the house, okay? Especially if you have a new house. It's not as much of an issue now because most of these houses are waterproof. But if your ground is, um, if you're just in an old neighborhood and it hasn't been maintained, you'll just find that the, the, the property level around the house, years and years of the grass growing and cutting and collecting leaves and rotting, the, the areas around the outside of the house actually start to grow up just an inch or two over 20, 30 years. But next to the house, because the sun beats down off the concrete, it's always burned off. You're not getting that same collection of uh, organics. And so you end up having this area around the house that collects water. So if you have a lot of heavy rain, you have two options. One, backfill and get the slope, okay? Or there is a third option for drainage system out there. You can take this same concept. You can dig a trench around your house, just a foot down, and you can put in a weeping tile here and cover it over with gravel. And you can have a collection system for heavy rain or if you're on a hill and your neighbor's yard is draining into yours, and you can actually collect all that water into this pipe and run that over and away from your property. And that can be really effective as well. Remember the rule here is if you can get rid of 90% of the water in rain events like major storms, the other 10% is not gonna cause you a major damage. Your house can handle that. You know what Red Guard is? Yes. Yeah, can you use that for foundation cracks? No. What about uh, Flex Seal? No. No, okay. You know, and, and this is a great question. Because we get people asking questions all the time. And I, and I love the creativity. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, the, the Western society is, is built on creative thinkers. But when it comes to your house, 
you don't want to be creative. You want to follow proven systems because everything we're talking about is a system. There's no one element here that's going to be the right answer or the solution to any problem. It's all about the system. And as soon as you introduce something into a system that hasn't been tested and proven, you're experimenting with your own property. And it might seem like a really good idea at the time, but that doesn't make it a good idea. Trust me, all through the 50s and 60s, there was enough experimenting going on with building construction and a whole lot of things went wrong, okay? Even today when they introduce new products, certain things will go wrong in the installation and the delivery of that product on a mass scale, like with spray foam insulation. Sound like a great idea at the time, but all somebody has to do is get the valves turned to the wrong pressure and what you end up with is that dead fish smell in your house. Unbelievable, right? So don't experiment with your homes, okay? <laughs> I know I'm a safety second guy, but I am a follow proven system first kind of guy. It doesn't mean it has to be the most expensive option in the world, but at least don't experiment on your home. What would happen to a house, an old house that mm. has a lot of a high water table and mm -hmm. no sump pump? Well, what's an old house? I don't, I'm older than you. Older than me? Yeah. Uh-huh. About my age, maybe? No, a lot older <laughs> than you. <laughs> well, first of all, um, you'll find that most really old houses weren't built in areas that had a high water table, right? Right. They, they did that on purpose mm -hmm. because they didn't have technology working in their favor. So they build on hills or um, uh, high up off the riverbank, okay? But if you, and, and technology has made us really kind of lazy and stupid. Because we can fix problems, we can build wherever we want to, we backfill swamps and just make it a neighborhood now. And you know, you run into major problems. But let's say the water table in this Crazy drawing. Man, we need something cleaner. Let's say it's here. All right. That's not bothering you. Right? You get a water event and then the water rises up and it gets this high. It's not bothering you because the weeping tile is there to take the extra water away. Okay? Let's say the water gets up to really high. Okay? We'll draw right at the concrete. Now, let's say your weeping tile is old. Maybe it's old clay tile, which was sections of, of pipe. That are, that are tapered, so you can stack them together. Kind of like a big, big pile of plastic cups for the waiter to run into a restaurant, right? Same concept, only there's no bottom in the, in the glasses. And they just run it all, that's what, that's what weeping tile is back in the old day, made out of clay. And if it's broken and fallen in and the dirt's filled up, then the water table can get really high. And when now you have pressure. And so if you have a high water table, the first thing you're gonna see is your concrete floor is gonna start getting wet lines or cracks and the water's gonna start seeping through. If you've got that going on, trust me, you wanna bust a hole in your floor, dig out a pit, put in a well, and sump it up. It is your only option. Uh, what would you do if you had a chalky basement floor? Like why does that happen? Chalky. Chalky. Uh, you're just dealing with uh, salts, right? And it's, it's natural, sweep it up. It's not toxic, it's not dangerous, it's not gonna bother you. It doesn't really mean anything's breaking down. Um, it's really of no effect, especially when you consider that the concrete floor is not a structural element, all right? It's more cosmetic. It's there so that you have something to stand on, and that's about all it does. So, not a big concern. What's the best way to insulate the basement concrete floor for a living space? Okay, so here's another question. Here, you know, I'm gonna do a new, new picture. Maybe we'll refer to this later. Insulating a floor. Um, okay. Excuse me, two seconds while I draw my little picture all over again. We'll start again, right? This is our grass line, and this is our water line. Okay, real quick, if you have a basement, then you live in an area where you get winter, and the bottom line is the temperature of the earth out here is 10 degrees. My scale. <laughs> I'm in Canada. <laughs> Matt, maybe you can convert that. Mm. Celsius and Fahrenheit. Okay. 10 to American. 10? <laughs> 10 degrees, one to the next. Right. The point is this, I'll answer the question. This is the temperature here. This is the temperature here. And that's percent. That's not degrees. It's just one circle. Folks, I have to apologize. I am extremely tired. I am busting my butt trying to finish the renovation of my daughter's house before Christmas. I'm not getting enough sleep. It's all right. And I do lay awake at night going, did I turn the water off? Am I flooding our new home? I'm having panic attacks. It's just crazy. All right. Do Ready we have for another number? question? No, do we have a number? 
10 degrees? Oh, it was uh, 40 degrees. 40 degrees. Okay, so yep. 10 or 40. Okay, so a quick answer. Underneath the house, it's 10 or 40. All right. Here's your ceiling. Here's your heat. Take a guess what the temperature of your floor is before you renovate your house. You got it. It's 10 or 40, depending where you live. All right. You put in a sofa and you're sitting there and you're watching TV. Okay. Your heart is in 10 degrees. That's why everybody who sits in a basement is freezing. So remember back in the 70s, we all had paneling, right? Or one little inch of styrofoam and we all thought we were insulating the basement because we were all just delirious. You're sitting in 10 degrees. That's hypothermia condition. You'll die. <laughs> you, can't, you can't hang out in your basement in that temperature. The heat blows down and then it rises. I don't care if you put R3000 down here. You're in 10 degrees because there's no source of heat at the floor in a basement. Okay? That's the challenge. The biggest goal that you have to deal with when you're trying to insulate your floor is you're not insulating the floor from the intrusion of cold. Okay? You're trying to fix the lack of heat supply. So what you do is you build an interior wall, you tap into your heat duct, and you bring a heat run down by the floor that blows hot air across the floor. Now, you're changing this up to 70, somewhere livable, okay? Changing this up to 18 degrees, and you can live there. Even if you don't insulate the floor, putting that heat register vent solves the entire problem, all right? Insulating your basement floor, honestly, if it does anything, it's gonna go from 10 and 40 to 10 and a half and 41. It's of no value to you. I don't care. They're selling there are a lot of people a lot of bull when it comes to this insulating your basement floor. No one's laying on their floor for a nap, all right? It's of no value to you. The only thing you need to do is protect the moisture transfer. Insulation in your floor does nothing in the grand scheme. If you bring down a heat vent, it'll cost you 20 bucks in about 30 minutes and you can solve the problem. Next uh, question. So just real quick. I almost just... got passionate about that, didn't I? Yeah. <laughs> you know how many, how many millions of dollars are spent in North America every year from people buying that lie from television shows, right? They're promoting products that they're saying, hey, you need to buy this, and they're garbage. They don't even work. Mm -hmm. it'd, be like, it'd be like insulating underneath your car on the outside. What good is that going to do you? Anyway, go ahead. Uh, so just clarify for people, just to tell them when the members are asking, like when they're all going to be answered, the member live stream. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, good point. We didn't do any channel business, did we? All right. Um, membership. We're doing a video from 7 to 8. Okay. It's going to be members only club this time. It's a very exclusive club. Um, yeah. So we're going to answer questions for that. So if you're interested or considering that, you can quick check out our video on members. Just do a little search in the search tool on the homepage. Or you can just click the button and hit join and be part of that live stream. And mm. we're going to answer all of your specific renovation questions. All right. Uh, so that help? how much better would uh, insulate on the floor work with the insulated air vents? Oh, okay. Well, here's the, here's the answer to that. Without the insulation on that floor and you have heat, you're blowing the air across, you're, you're bringing the heat up to normal. Okay. This, this, this cold that's underneath the slab, it's very passive. There's no airflow. And with, without an airflow to bring that temperature into this room, it's very, very passive. And you're going to find that it's going to maintain it almost perfectly. Now, if you've got little critters running around, right? You're using the family room in the basement as a family living space, and you've got newborns, and they're crawling around the floor, and you're concerned about it, and you've got a budget, and you don't mind investing to make that 70, uh, 75, then go ahead and insulate the floor. I didn't say it doesn't work at all. I just said there's no real return on the investment. And it is useless unless you have a heat supply at the floor. Okay? So yeah, it's, it's another step in the evolution. But the lion's share of the solution is the heat supply. Adding insulation, it'll have a little bit of value. And if you want to have that, I did everything I could to help provide the perfect environment for my child experience, then go ahead and insulate it if it's not going to be an issue. Uh, are you aware of the company named Cardine Flooring Company? No. No? Okay. Uh, I Don't think it's a more. vinyl company. They're wondering if you can apply it over self-leveling compound on your concrete basement floor. 
Yeah, you can put vinyl on anything. End of discussion. You can you can pour driveway asphalt in your basement for all I care and put vinyl flooring on it. It doesn't matter. Uh, 19th... It can be over the, 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 you know, the road of bones in Russia. You could vinyl that floor. It would it'd be just fine. Uh, 1953 bathroom remo uh, remodel slab on grade. Uh, how do I do the vapor barrier where it runs down the wall to the concrete? Okay, so that's not a basement question. We're going to try to stay on topic, but real quick. When I do my videos, I'm coming from a perspective of a northern climate in a lot of cases. So be careful you don't apply northern climate technology to southern climate construction. If you're slab on grade, the majority of the time you're in the south. You're in a zone where you don't put a vapor barrier on the inside of your house. We can deal with that on the next live stream. That right. might not be a bad idea. But please, if you're in the south and you're watching my installation technology videos and how I'm renovating, it may not apply to you. So be careful with that you could be actually um, causing more harm than helping. So always consult with your own building office before you do a major renovation to confirm the information you're getting is relative to your zone. 